It's episode 12 of the Triathlete Hour, and today we have two very interesting and very different conversations for you. The legendary Andy Potts has a lot of advice for triathletes about going after what you want, how it all came into focus for him, and how pooping yourself is only worth it if you're going for the win. He first tried to make the Olympics in swimming and just missed out. Turned to triathlon, his wife was diagnosed with cancer, and then it made them both realize it was time to do what you love. Andy has been a fixture on the pro tri scene for 18 years, but he's always entertaining and always has a lot to say. First up though, we have a topic and a conversation that's on everyone's minds. How can we make triathlon more diverse and more welcoming to minority communities? Dr. Shauna Payne-Gold is the expert on the topic, and she talks to us briefly here about barriers to access and what can be done. All that after a short break. If you've been paying attention to what the pros are doing, then you've probably heard about Whoop. Whoop is a fitness wearable that provides personalized insights on how recovered you are and how much stress you put your body through during the day. Each day when you get up, Whoop gives you a recovery score based on your sleep, resting heart rate, and heart rate variability. And the way it works is you wear the Whoop band around your wrist all day. And don't worry, it's 100% waterproof. It even tracks your heart rate while you're swimming. You can then analyze your activity and recovery levels in the app. And you can use features like Strain Coach, which gives you target workout exertion goals tailored to your body's recovery for that day. You can even set to tell you when you've hit your target strain effort for the day. Like, okay, that was good. Now you can stop. There's also a built-in sleep coach which lets you know how much sleep you should be getting based on your expected activity level for the next day. And it tracks all your different sleep cycles. Whoop is offering 15% off right now with the code triathlete at checkout. Go to whoop, W-H-O-O-P.com and enter triathlete at checkout to save 15%. Sleep better, recover faster and train smarter. Optimize your performance with Whoop today. Well, so I'm talking to Dr. Shauna Payne-Gold, who is an expert in diversity and inclusion. She's an assistant provost of diversity and inclusion at Towson University, a swim coach, a triathlete, like you do everything, basically. (laughs) I I try. It's not enough hours in the day, of course, but I try to get as much done as possible. So I always wonder whether triathlon keeps my head in the game for my professional work in DEI work or if DEI works really leads me to triathlon. But I think it's a (laughs) chicken or the egg type thing going on. You're like, hope, yeah, hopefully it all works out. Um, so, yeah, obviously, uh, you know, there's a lot happening in the world right now. Um, some conversations that, you know, people are starting to have that probably, you know, should have been having for a while. And I know a lot of people, you know, are coming to me and asking, like, what about triathlon? You know, why is triathlon so white? Because it is super white. Um, what is it? Less than half a percent of USA mm-hmm. triathlon members are black. That's right. Yeah, that's that's right. right. Absolutely. Yeah. Less than a percent. And, you know, I think is really interesting about that, though, is that, you know, we're we're talking about right now, we're talking about the fruit, but we're not talking about the root to the tree. (laughs) And the root to the tree is like a whole lot of stuff as it relates to structural racism, systemic racism. Um, uh, I wrote an article, this was, gosh, a couple of years ago that specifically looked at just the access to pools, for example. Mm -hmm. Um, We have, for example, i focus on higher education administration in particular. And so we're always talking about recreation centers and athletics and so forth. Well, you know, there are very few uh, historically black colleges and universities that even have pools on their campuses. So how can folk at all, period. Um, And so how can you um, create this culture around swimming, for example, that can lead into lots of things if you don't have a pool? Um, Or even in communities like mine, for example, I live in a predominantly African-American County, Prince George's County, right outside of Washington, D.C., and you're still relatively hard pressed to find a public pool um, that has actual lanes to swim laps rather Mm -hmm. than a recreational pool where my six year old and nine year old can go splash. I don't want to go to a splash park. I want to go to a pool where I can actually swim laps and learn how to swim and it's deep enough and all these things. And so, you know, I think that it's really relatively interesting that it's been an entire system that's been created that really doesn't perpetuate the sports in any of the three other than running, frankly. You mean in terms of, you know, what people are able to do and what they have access to? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. You know, if, if you have to pay, so I, I think about this constantly. So whether it's open water swim or whether it's an actual lap pool, 
I fortunately, even as a African-American woman in this country right now, have access to that. I can pay the, you know, the 20, what, 25 bucks uh, of (laughs) um, a monthly fee. You know, I can pay the 25 bucks to go to LA Fitness every, uh, every, anytime I want to, frankly. Um, I can pay the, you know, 20 bucks to do my open water swim every Sunday. But what if you don't have that? What if you don't have that kind of money? Um, if I look back, I don't want to go back and look at my bank statement to see how much I've paid between gym memberships and uh, pool access. Well, lots of people can't afford that. And so what does it mean when you don't have access? Um, the sports that are the most popular around minoritized populations are the sports that don't cost as much. We can do soccer. We can do basketball. There's a basketball hoop in every community. Mm-hmm. You know, So given that, it's less expensive, which means more access. Um, if you ask a kid to go ride a bike, that may be something a little bit different. <laughs> so, right. you know, given that, you know, how has the structure been built in a way that doesn't allow us to access certain things? It's a whole structure with a long history behind it. Right. I mean, because obviously, once you start talking about, you know, what are the barriers to triathlon participation? Everyone says, oh, it's really expensive, but it's expensive for everybody. Like, why is that uniquely specific for, you know, minority communities? Mm hmm. mm -hmm. Well, you know, I think what's interesting about the whole um, (laughs) the whole socioeconomic thing thing, (laughs) uh, you know, I I just want to leave it at thing because I could go I could, you know, write a dissertation on that thing. Um, And again, that goes back to what does it mean to have access, not just to money, but also even the concept of triathlon. I don't know about anybody else, but I didn't know that triathlon existed until I was well into my 30s. I'm only into my what's uh, seventh season. Um, of any triathlon at all, I had no clue it even existed. I knew that people swam, I knew people rode bikes, and I knew people ran. I didn't know that they did it all, all at one time in one event. And so given that, you know, what does that say about how early we're exposed to certain sports? Um, I'm thrilled that Hampton University now has a triathlon team because at least we now know that college-age students um, who are students of color are being exposed to the sport in total. Um, and so given that, you know, even if you have a million bucks, if you don't know it exists, you can't tap into it. And so, you know, for me, I'm like, you know, if you don't know it exists, like my kids walk around, they're like, the only thing they know exists is triathlon, frankly, because that's all <laughs> I've done. You know, that's all I've done. Um, and so given that, I think it's crucial, you know, what type of access and what type of visual um, do folks have at younger ages that give them access earlier? Um, so I think it was two Junes ago. So June, what, 2018. Um, I did escape the Cape out at Cape May, Jersey, mm-hmm. and it was a fantastic experience. You jump off a ferry like a fool and you swim for shore. And that's how you start a triathlon. And what was so powerful about that was that a Boy Scout troop was standing there as I was coming out of the water that actually saw all these people start a triathlon in their community. They have now been exposed to it. And I guarantee you there's going to be a bunch of folks that decide they want to be swimmers and, and, right, triathlon right. and so forth because they've been exposed early. But if you don't know about it, you can't engage whether you have a little money or a lot. You, you can't because you haven't envisioned it. You haven't been exposed to it. And there aren't even really any. Um, well, I was going to say there aren't any black uh, pro triathletes because like Max Fennel was the first. But now he's like off doing his own thing. I don't even know what Max is doing these days, being on TV. And, yeah, yeah. and that's it. Like there isn't. That's it. Right. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, you know, Sika Henry is, is mm-hmm. breaking out as well, um, you know, as our uh, first African-American female professional. And so, you know, given that, you know, where's the resources for those um, for those athletes? You know, can we get to a place where those individuals can say, oh, I can leave my job <laughs> and, and do this for a living every single day? You know, where where are the sponsorships for those individuals? And so, you know, given that who's supporting them to be able to focus solely because, you know, I of course, people like me are supposed to be like middle to back of the pack because (laughs) we're working every day like dogs. We're raising kids. We're doing life. And oh, by the way, we do a little bit of triathlon just to keep our sanity. Of course, we're supposed to be in the back. But how can you be in the front if you have to do all those very same things and you're also fighting against the challenges of not having access? You know, and so given that, I think it's, it's crucial to think about, you know, how do we support those athletes who are the first at whatever? Mm-hmm. Um, because, you know, it's tough to be the first, you know, it was, it was for, it was tough for the first woman that decided to run the Boston marathon. It was, <laughs> you know, we can go down the list of history, even in athletics around what it means to be the first at anything from any underrepresented demographic It's tough. Um, and so I think it's, it's crucial to, you know, give them the opportunities as much as possible. Um, and not saying the Benedict rules or anything of that nature, but again, how can you connect and really um, 
really thoughtful ways that are intentional, right. you know, because it's not just, if it were, if it was going to happen organically when it comes to inclusion and so forth, then it would have already happened. It's not going <laughs> to happen. You know, it, it just would have already happened. And so what can we do to direct the conversation a little bit more, I think is really important. I mean, that obviously like brings us to our next question because we kind of talked about some of the barriers, you know, there's the financial, there's the access, there's the like historic systemic access. Like when we talk about pool access, guys, like go and do some reading. There was people dumping bleach in pools when they tried to integrate them. Like there's a reason that this is a big issue. Um, And then we talk about representation. But now so those are like the barriers. But now let's talk about what can we do? Like what is being done? How can we overcome those barriers actively? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I hear you. And, you know, and speaking of even what you just said, as far as, you know, pouring bleach and pools and so forth, you know, I mean, I, I'm not that old, by the way, you know, I'm, I'm 42. And, you know, my grandmother, um, my, excuse me, my mother still talks about how it was systemically set up in my hometown, where the only time that there was access to a pool was on Wednesday nights between six and nine o'clock. Well, nobody black was going to go swimming necessarily because that's time for church in the South. Hmm. That's time for Bible study. We're not going to swim because we need to go to the house of the Lord. So, you know, we're, we're making this. <laughs> and so, yeah. And so given that, you know, I think the, the systems are set up for us um, not to have access in certain ways. Um, but I do think as far as the what can we do situation, I think that um, one of the biggest things is first not to not to force people of color or marginalized people to have to say something first all the time. Right. Yeah. Um, so for example, I have a really good friend of mine um, who identifies as Muslim. Well, it should not be a, Oh, I need to have a letter writing campaign in order for her to be able to have transition space to change because she cannot be in the same space as men, for example, it, it should not have to be all of that, especially someone that's at a, you know, a full 140.6 distance that's done it nationally and internationally. Should not be happening. Um, so, you know, that's one thing. Don't let people of color or marginalized people have to be the first voice to say anything. Um, I think the other thing, too, and I think this wave is going across the country, mm-hmm. is that holding our holding the business of triathlon accountable. And what I mean by that is race directors. Ask your race directors, why isn't this demographic more diverse here? I see that we have you know, 20 racks of men um, in transition, but we've got, you know, five racks of women. What have you done in your marketing that has really highlighted women, for example, or whatever underrepresented population mm-hmm. there? Um, so hold hold the business accountable would be my second thing. Um, and then my third thing that I would say quite clearly is that um, try to educate ourselves on all the different demographics that make up triathlon. Mm-hmm. You know, I yes, I obviously think of it as a black person. I mean, I've been in races where there were 2000 athletes and I could count less than 10 people of color in the entire race. Um, And so, and that's happened more than once, by the way. Um, And so, you know, given that, you know, yes, be aware of who you are, but also be aware of all the other demographics that intersect. So, you know, what does it mean for a trans person to toe the line with you? And they're not quite sure whether they should get a pink cap or a blue cap because really they don't affiliate with either identity. Uh, So thinking about all the different interactions, um, And I I think the last piece is um, when it comes to different identities, especially when it comes to even body image, you know, I've had people that walked up on um, an individual who may have been more heavy set, for example, because I've been there 80 pounds ago, many years ago, um, walking up on that person thinking, oh, they're a volunteer or, you know, the thing. And it's like, wait a minute, let let's not let's not judge based on the you know, what is the saying? Don't judge the book by its cover. Um, there are people around us that may not fit what we think are stereotypes and welcome everyone. Go out of your way to be kind to everyone. I don't care whether they're a volunteer or a pro athlete. When do we get to a place where we make it our business to make everyone feel like they belong? Because really, this is about belonging. Right. Do you feel like you belong? And so those are just a a few things that I would think of off the top of my head to do. Yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously, it is about like, how do we make more people of different backgrounds feel like they belong in triathlon and have access to triathlon. Um, Those were all like very uh, metaphorical things, like emotional. (laughs) They weren't like, let's start this program. Do you think any Mm -hmm. of the, there are some programs that have been started, some grants, some clubs, some initiatives. Uh, Mm -hmm. Do you think any Mm -hmm. of them are like really, any stand out as like working for you? 
Oh, well, let me put my my shameless plug in here about <laughs> my tri group. That's um, a, a, a I would call it a national tri group, really. But um, my um, facts, my fast chicks tri club. Oh, um, yeah, chick- we, we covered them. Okay. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, we have so much fun. It, it started it was started by uh Colonel Yvonne Spencer, who is full bird in the Air Force. Um, and what I think is so powerful about her movement is that she's created a space where everyone is welcome, no matter your background, race, any of that. Um, and what's uh, really cute about it is that it's not about speed. <laughs> it's not about speed at all. It's about um, doing something that you love and being better than your former self every single day. And I think that's what's crucial about Fast Chicks. And so she created this online environment it ended up becoming this movement. And then we started having meetups every year. Hmm. And so what was very cool about that, even with some of the more seasoned women that are in Fast Chicks, giving money so that uh, brand new triathletes would at least try it and see see if this is something that you would love. Um, me personally, I have uh, done my best to provide as many swim lessons as possible to people who are afraid of water, just like I was. I was afraid to even put my face in the water, much less open water. Really? Not me. Um, and so people are doing this in ways that are very clear in that tri club. And I think there's lots of ways to do that, even if it's a small group, um, pull folks together, even if there's one season person, I don't care if that one season person has done an Olympic and that's all they've ever done. They're still five steps ahead of the right. person that still hasn't put their face in the water. So, um, yeah, the, I think clubs like fast chicks really does help because it provides the infrastructure for you to at least try it. And hopefully when you fall in love with it, you know, that group continues on and you continue to have this network of people that are there for you. Yeah. Okay. That's, I mean, makes sense. We got to start clubs and teach people how to swim and get them out yeah. on bikes. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. How, how do I clip in and out has been the, the oh, biggest. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now that the weather has opened up, it's like, how do I not kill myself trying to clip in and out on this bike? That's yeah. 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 I've, I've tried to help some people figure that out. It's tricky. You fall a lot. It is. That's the answer. It is. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. Yep. For sure. Um, well, is there anything else I feel like, you know, that you want our listeners to know mm. or that they should do or think about, um, you know, before we kind of, mm. I mean, mm-hmm. obviously this topic, I mean, I've seen you sit on panels, we've had conferences about it. Like <laughs> it's right. a massive topic, but. Yeah. Well, you know, I think the the biggest thing that's turning the tide around this topic in total is that. Folks are finding out that it's not enough just to be not racist or not sexist or what it's it's not okay to be neutral. We have to make a choice as to where we stand. And so I think we're we're returning the corner. Up to this point, it's been, I'm not part of the problem, right? And that's been kind of the thought. I'm not part of the problem. I'm not being mean to people. I'm not telling people mm-hmm. that uh, they can't be in this triathlon or be in my pool with me. I think we're turning a corner now where we're saying you can't just not be racist. You have to be actively anti-racist. You have to be actively whatever. Um, And so it's causing people to take responsibility for their own actions and take responsibility for um, not just sitting on a log waiting for problems to solve themselves. Like I was saying before, Mm -hmm. it's not going to fix itself organically. It's going to take a whole lot of really good hearted people to make this work. And so I I wrote this uh, Facebook post, this was a couple of days ago that kind of put people into categories. You know, obviously we have people that are like, you know, racist and sexist and all the ists. We have those kind of bad people. Then we have the good people that are fighting the good fight all the time. You know, they have, they're going to support people and be out there and active and put their neck on the line. Then you have those folks that are, I'm going to sit here and be quiet because I don't want to be uncomfortable, but I'm also not going to be part of the problem. And those folks that are sitting comfortably without being part of the problem still end up being part of the problem. Mm -hmm. And so I I think that's where people are going to have to uh, pick a side as uncomfortable as it is, um, because I think there are many more good people out there than not so good people out there. They just haven't found a voice yet. Um, And so once they find that voice and get actively involved, reach out to a person of color in triathlon and say, Hey, what can I do to support you or your tri club? Or, Hey, can I meet up with you? Or, you know, Oh, that guy at the bike shop was an asshole to you. Can I come with you next time? Whatever it takes, um, but being that active person, I've, I've had um, two race directors that messaged me because I've worked with them on diversity work before that messaged me to say flat out, I don't know what to say to you right now, but just know that I'm with you 100%. And if you ever need anything from me, let me know. I so appreciate that because that's what it means to be an ally and a friend to communities that you're not a part of. You don't want to overstep your boundaries, but right. you're very clear that your voice should be heard. 
Um, so I, I would challenge people to um, not not uh, not ride the line, but pick, pick a side here. Which side are you going to be on and be on it? You know, if you if you're going to be uh, dedicated to it, then, you know, give it 100 percent. I appreciated the the concrete in real life examples, because to be clear, that's not just posting on Instagram or Facebook or there it's like go. going Absolutely. out and doing stuff. All right. Um, well, thank Absolutely. you so much for for chatting with us. And obviously, we you know, continue to talk about this because uh, I don't think it's going to yeah. be fixed like right away. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I had a my, my magic wand hasn't been working lately, Kelly. I'm telling you, it's, it's not working. Uh, but we're, we're getting there slowly but surely. It's a process. One quick note, I did mention the first African-American pro triathlete, Max Fennell, and I said I wasn't sure what he was up to these days. He assures me he is, in fact, still racing. So apologies to Max. Next up, our conversation with Andy Potts. We're triathletes. We like to know how we're performing and how we could be better. We want all the data. And that's where Whoop comes in. Whoop is a fitness wearable that tracks your heart rate, heart rate variability, sleep, activity levels, calories burned, and most importantly, recovery. Every day, Whoop gives you a recovery score based on how your body is recovered from the day before. So you can know if today's the day to tackle that huge workout or maybe adjust and pull back a little, take an extra nap. Whoop is offering 15% off right now with the code triathlete at checkout. Go to whoop, W-H-O-O-P dot com and enter triathlete at checkout to save 15%. Sleep better, recover better, and train better. Get faster right now with Whoop. All right, we're joined this week by Andy Potts, who in some ways needs no introduction, right? Many time winner of things, Olympian, 70.3 world champ. Uh, and Andy, you're in Colorado right now, and I know... You're just getting back to swimming, right? Just like the rest of us, dealing with all the swim reservation stuff. Yeah, so it is reservations. Um, uh, actually, today it opened up for there are open hours, so you don't actually need to have the like I did. I was doing the sign up sheet for right. a few weeks, and now it's uh, open swim. Um, um, so that was that was super helpful. That's crazy. It's, who knew we were going to get back to things so quickly? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I, you know, I think that it's interesting that, um, people are choosing a bunch of different ways to, you know, approach it. Uh, I don't think there's a, that, I don't really think there's a wrong way to approach it as long as you're cognizant of what's happening, um, of what people are asking for. Right. And I think that's what people are, uh, making plans around is, you know, a lot of people are good, good to go. Like no factor, keep it rolling. I'm good. But what's hard to predict is the, like the, uh, the fear. And that's hard to convince someone of their, of the, they shouldn't be fearful anymore. Um, it's always a trap game. And so people are pretty cognizant about that, which is nice. So is that like, you're in Colorado Springs, right? And so that's kind of how the situation is right there. Cause obviously we've been asking everybody, you know, what was your quarantine situation? How are things going down? And it sounds like, you know, things are starting to go back to normal for you guys. Yeah, they're not as normal as I would like. But well, they're pretty, <laughs> yeah, but they are getting back. Um, the team I swim on, Colorado Springs swim team, uh, we had their, uh, my son had his first day of practice today. Oh, wow. So they, they, a pool opened up and they were able to get, uh, I think it was six hours back to back to back. So it's all their groups were able to get in and, um, which is, which is totally awesome. So, um, I was, I was excited for him to be able to get back to gain a little bit nor more normalcy. And, um, so gyms are opening up, uh, at, we're right now in Colorado Springs, we're at 25% capacity, which, you know, when you have a, a fire code capacity, so if you've got a big place, you can, you can run a fairly comprehensive program without too much, uh, repercussions. And how are things for you? I mean, in terms of normalcy, you, what races were you supposed to do? What have you missed? Like, how have you been dealing with all that? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so yesterday was escape from Alcatraz. I know. I was supposed to do that too. It's, but we had a sand ladder challenge. So I, I have a <laughs> coaching business and we have like 300 athletes and we offered this up for not just our athletes, but for anybody. And it was, um, it's our challenge. It's our challenge of su summer challenge series totally free to enter. We're giving away free stuff. Uh, I've got really great sponsors that have jumped on board and la yesterday was the sand ladder challenge. Okay. So, uh, we had to go up 400 steps and you could do it any which way you wanted to. If you didn't have steps, you could just go up a steep hill. Um, if you had like, we have an incline here, so we use that. Um, 
some people who live in New York, they just climbed right up their uh, apartment building. <laughs> um, we had uh, one person who had a, a slide into a pool and she used the steps to go up and then the slide to go down. So it, okay. People are creative. Last weekend, I was supposed to have raced uh, the Triple T Challenge in uh, Ohio. Okay. Uh, it's a kind of, um, uh, it's got a good folk uh, presence and good old school triathlon presence, which is, it's like basically a prologue on Friday, two Olympic distances on Saturday and a half on Sunday. The cumulative total is an Ironman. Oh. So we did that as a challenge uh, to our athletes. And then we kicked everything off on Memorial Day with a CrossFit challenge from the Murph. Oh, the Murph. You know the Murph? Did you do it? Of course I did. <laughs> All right. So our our Murph was a little bit modified. What we did was you, the, a traditional Murph is a mile run, 100 pull-ups, 200 squats. No, sorry. 100 pull-ups, 200 push-ups, right. 300 air squats, and then a mile run. And you're supposed to do it with a 20 pound weight vest. We had it modified. We did not do the weight vest and we did 20 rounds of five, 10, 15 of each exercise. Okay. And how did it go? Cause the last time I tried to do that, I like could not pick my arms up. <laughs> it was terrible. <laughs> okay. So we have 125 people who entered into the challenge. Uh, I'm going to say a hundred percent of them had issues functioning till Thursday. <laughs> And did you, and did you do it too? Were you I okay? absolutely did it. Yep. Okay. I made sure I did strict push-ups and strict pull-ups. Okay. Um, good form on the, all the way down on the squats. I was, uh, yeah, full, great form. My son, he did it with us. He did it in 31 minutes, oh, wow. not weight vested. I did it in 58 minutes. Um, so, but we had a, we had a nice crew. We, we were socially distanced, of course, uh, but it was fun. We had a good time. All right. So it sounds like you're doing a lot of the like coming up with random challenges, kind of keeping yourself motivated, all that kind of thing. Yeah. And I, I think the big thing that people were craving was were uh, is engagement. Right. Okay. So they want the connectivity. And so that was what we uh, my I have a business partner who started up AP Racing with me. Um, his name is Daniel. Daniel, and I thought, like, hey, let's just have great community with our an event and we can make it whatever we want um the, the next challenge is is a mile run okay uh, so so they can be short challenges they can be an ironman like we did last weekend uh, it's not every weekend and what we were looking for was like we're just looking for videos and commentary and pictures and a way for people to say like you're not alone People want the connectivity, the, the sense of community and that camaraderie that we wanted to build. That's been the most important and the most impactful thing. And the engagement has been fantastic. And of course I do, I, I've done every, um, everything. Uh, first two, uh, sorry, this, uh, the first one, the Murph and the last one, the Sand Ladder Challenge, the kids did them with me. Okay. So it's been great. The kids did not do an Ironman. They but, were not, no. No, no. Um, and it's flexible too. So based off of your conditions and where you are, what you have at your disposal, if you don't have access to water, you didn't have to do the swim. If you, um, if you can't do us anything on Sunday, you can do Thursday, Friday, Saturday, or something like that. So we're flexible with it. And the, and the, the creativity of people, that's been the most special aspect. So are you missing racing at all? Or are you just like, nope, I'm good. Uh, it's fine. Uh, so I've been racing a while <laughs> I know, <laughs> and, uh, I actually do miss it. Okay. Um, I miss it for the, the reasons that may or may not be obvious. So I miss it for, um, the sen like exactly the reasons we started the challenge series. I miss it for the sense of community. Um, I miss it for that release that, you know, you, you, you want. Um, and I miss it for the sense of like, that sense of purpose that you get in your training. Um, it's like, well, the why, why am I pushing so hard? Why am I challenging myself so much right now when I don't have a, that next? Mm -hmm. And for me, it, the, that's probably what I've missed the most. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you are, you are ready for it to come back eventually. You're not going to just keep doing random challenges. No, no, no. I'm not going to become like a YouTube star or anything like that. I, I think um, that's in your future, actually. Um, no, I, I, I actually, I'm pining for it to come back. Um, 
I, I miss the, the, the interaction with different cultures and the different people. Um, that's always been a special part of, of our sport and, and because it's global. Mm-hmm. And then, um, yeah, I, I would prefer to have like, uh, the laser focus that I usually have. It's, it's a little disconcerting to not have it right now. Uh, just it's like, oh, do I need to be getting up at five in the morning? Nope. I'm going to sleep till 7.30. Or it's one of these. Do I need to get up at 5 in the morning? Nope. I'm going to sleep till 10.14. <laughs> it's also fine. Yeah, yeah. And so I, I, I wish I had a little bit more consistency with it. But okay. I've been pretty consistent for a really long time in my life. So I'm, I'm allowing the hair to let down on that with, in that regard. I was going to say, you've been doing triathlon for, what, 19 years now? It's a very long time. 19 years triathlon and I swam for 18. Before so that, yeah. Put them together, right? So are you, do you ever get tired? How has it changed over that time too? That's what I always want, you know, that's a long time. Triathlon's changed a lot in 20 years. It has, it's matured, uh, evolved um, for the better, I think. Uh, when I first started doing triathlon, uh, it was draft legal, but things were um, a wet run. Oh yeah, back in the day, yeah. Okay. And then, uh, it, I came in and I, I started swimming fast and I was like, Oh, you better be able to swim and run. Right. And we kind of held hands a little bit on the bike and then the bike started getting legit. And now what it is, is if you can't swim, bike or run, if you are, have a big, big hole, you're out, mm-hmm. you're off the podium, um, at the, at the major races. So, right. uh, that, that's been nice. Um, I love to see that because triathlon is about balancing all three sports. Um, so it's been, you know, I would get frustrated in the early years because I felt like if I, if I were, uh, if I had the goods on the day and I was, I felt like I was the most complete triathlete on the day, I could still see myself off of the podium, like fourth or fifth, Mm -hmm. I had a really good run, but not a great run, but I was ready to lay it down on the bike. But, it was, it wasn't a judicious use of my energy. Right. Um, you'd find yourself on the outside looking in sometimes and that, that would, that would be frustrating. Um, and that kind of precipitated my shift into non-drafting. Oh, for sure. You hear more. that from, from IT racers, but that's, that's starting to change too. You kind oh, of have to it's be, oh, yeah. Change. yeah. <laughs> and yeah, you started yeah, out yeah. as a swimmer, you said though, too. I mean, which, that was like, I mean, when we say start as a swimmer, like you were fourth at the Olympic trials, like a very good swimmer, not just casually. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I swam some, a few laps. A few in laps. The, back in the day. I was listening. You did a podcast with TRS Triathlon a few years ago about your mm-hmm. years at University of Michigan on the swim team. And I rem- I like don't remember all the details, but I remember that there were some very raunchy stories about what you did at the University of Michigan. I was a college kid. You know, what? It, what's a 20-year-old to do? Um, we had some really fun times at Michigan. Just some of my lifelong friends are, you know, we, we spent, I spent five years there. I was on the five-year plan. Nice. Um, and yeah, in, in that podcast, they were being fed um, stories from a teammate of mine, uh, who was a, tra- a professional triathlete and her name was uh, Emily Cox. Oh, I know Emily. Okay. Yeah. She swam at Michigan with me. We're same class. So she knew all the dirt and she was feeding it to him. Oh, okay. So there's dirt out there in Andy Potts. He's been around long enough. You can find it. <laughs> yeah. You can dig it up. Yeah. It's mo- it's innocent enough because just because I was an idiot. Right, right, right. Okay. But then you obviously, I mean, swimming was like your whole thing. I mean, you said you swam for 18 years. You were trying to make the Olympics as a swimmer. And you like just missed it. Were you an, how does that, how does that work out then? Are you an alternate? Are you like, okay, I'm out. I'm done with swimming. Like screw it. Yeah. I think you have to look into the psyche and the mentality mm-hmm. of swimmers. Okay. So this was in the mid nineties. Uh, it was 96 trials. Uh, I knew where I stood. I knew the pecking order. Uh, so it, it was obvious. I swam with the guys who went one, two in trials and they also went one, two at the games. They were friends of mine. I was the first person to give them hugs after, cause I'm literally the, the lane over. <laughs> um, but I mean, they were showing me how to make an Olympic team every day. Right. And I knew where I stood. Uh, so it wasn't anything shocking. Hmm. I wished I popped a little bit better of a race, but I mean, the two, two guys, uh, 
Tom Dolan and Eric Namesnick. They were just fantastic swimmers and they represent our country quite well at the games. So gold and silver. And, um, that is yeah, crazy I, though, to be like, Oh, I got beat by the gold and silver medalists. And oh, I yeah, make yeah. The team. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, like, I think, I think my time would have finaled in the games, right. but, um, I knew the rules. Right. I, I knew the game before the game. Um, I wasn't surprised. I was a little bummed. I mean, I'm definitely bummed, mm -hmm. but, um, I thought I'd have a better mile than I did at the, um, at trials. Um, but it was onward and upward. Okay. Uh, I thought, I thought I'd maybe have a different, better chance in 2000, but I was, uh, I was done with the sport at, in 99. That's what I was going to ask you is how do you decide then? Okay. I'm going to move on to triathlon. That's going to be where I make the Olympics. Um, instead of just being like, all right, I'm done. I'm out. I'm going to go get a real job. Like screw this. I did that. You did that. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then yep, you came back. That happened. Uh, check that box. Uh, so it, when 2000 rolled around, I also knew my pecking order. Um, Michael Phelps was coming into his own. Um, and then we had another guy named Eric Vent. They also went one, two at trials and one, two at the Olympics in Sydney. Um, again, I was probably like, you know, his top 20 in the world, but, um, you need to be top two in the U S uh, if you're going to make the team and it's pretty obvious. So, uh, I wasn't delusional. Um, I, I thought when I graduated Michigan, I thought maybe I saw other avenues to be successful in the business world. And uh -huh. I thought that was potentially what I wanted, but I needed to experience it to find out what I didn't want. And I don't know if you've had that experience. Like, Oh yeah. I don't know what I want. So let's start eliminating what I don't want to help me figure it out. Okay. Um, so I had like seven jobs in between, uh, maybe more than that, maybe nine jobs in between stopping swimming and starting triathlon. Got it. And you, none, and you were like, I don't want this one. I don't want this one. I don't want this one. Uh, <laughs> it was pretty, it was pretty clear cut. However, one of them was pretty cool. Uh, okay. I was an assistant coach at uh, UNLV for swimming. Oh. I could see myself being a swim coach. Um, if, if, if triathlon didn't pan out. And what made you then, how did you end up with triathlon? Like, had you been biking and running? Were you like, Oh, that looks like they don't know how to swim. I'll go do that. No, I'm kidding. No, no. So, all right. So this is uh 2000 mm -hmm. Sydney debuts the, the games with the sport of triathlon. Right. And I was like, it's in the games. That's awesome. Cause that's what I want to, I want to go to the games. Uh, what do I need to do? I was always a good runner. Uh, we would run in September, basically, okay. as swimmers. And it was just like a bunch of pachyderms, you know, top-heavy athletes just trying to get some cardio fitness. Um, but I was always decent. It was myself and two other guys I swam with. Um, we And we actually did this in college um, in the month of September as well. So it was in high school we did it. I would run with my buddy Chris uh, and then my other buddy Kevin. And then in college I would run with two guys – uh, Mike McQua, who's a coach as well. And then, um, uh, Owen von Richter is a year older and it, it turned into a great, uh, triathlete as well. Uh, I actually got to give him his medal in Kona. We raced the same day and oh. he was about an hour behind me as, as an age grouper. Uh, so that was really awesome. Um, and so I was a good, good runner and I would ride my bike everywhere. Oh. Like that was my mode of transportation. So I was like, Oh, I was always told I would make a good triathlete, but it was a really young sport. And I was like, okay, I will give it a shot. And then I um, bought a bike. Uh, I did a few things in between, like gained 50 pounds. <laughs> uh, and then it just, um, like, it, it became one track. And uh, I don't know if you've heard this from other other people, but it, like, it, it just became one of those things, like, where the focus went on. It was out of focus, out of focus. And all of a sudden, things came into focus, huh. just like you would on a camera. And it was, that was my mind and it became, all right, game on. I'm going to make this happen. This is what I'm going to do. I didn't give myself plan B. Once I went into the sport of triathlon, it was, I'm going to will this to happen. I mean, it worked out. You made the Olympics like four years later, right? So, uh, yeah, yeah. I didn't actually start the process until Oh, two. Oh, well then you made so, the Olympics two years later. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, it took a little while to get like up to speed and the the inertia and the wheels rolling. 
I think that was because I just didn't know. Right. I didn't know who I was. I was really struggling. Like post college, you got options, but you don't have a path. Um, you don't know. You know who you are, but you don't know where you want to go. Okay. And triathlon so, really helped you. Like once once you got that, you were like, "This is it. This is who I yeah. want to be. This is where I'm going." <laughs> yeah, but but here's the thing: it wasn't always like it just wasn't super clear. So. Um, Athens Olympics 04 happens. And then after it, I thought, I honestly had thoughts of like, okay, I got to do that childhood dream. Right. I got it. I did it. Like that was just mind blown. Like, wow. Um, maybe I'm done. Maybe I move on. Um, and then I had a conversation with my wife, maybe like two months after the Olympics. And I was like, you know, I might be able to be pretty good at triathlon if I focus on it, right? If I, if I keep going, like, right. I'm, imagine, like, I've learned so much already. What if I keep going? We could live life on our own terms. And Lisa, my wife, was like, "That's what we're doing." Um, and we also, we were old enough to have perspective. And then. Um, my wife was actually diagnosed with uh, cancer. Right. So she had two surgeries and she was going through all this. Uh, she didn't actually tell me until after the Olympics. She knew before. Really? And she didn't tell me. Wow. Yeah. So she held it. She was like, I'm not going to ruin your Olympic move moment. Um, I'm like, wow. you should have told me. Yeah, anyway. they, were you upset about that or was that? I'm not upset because she right. got a clean bill of health right. you know, six years later. And she's just the most wonderful person ever. Um, yeah, it was emotional. Yeah. Um, I, there wasn't a wrong answer. Right, right, right. But that's what made you realize, like, all right, we're going to live life the way we want to live it. Mm -hmm. Okay. That sense of mortality, that um, just that sense of, like, do what you – life's too short. Do what you want to do. Yeah. Okay. And so she was all supportive too. I would ask. She was like, let's do it. Let's go. I yeah, also like you how all... you were in the Olympics. Then you were like, oh, maybe I could be good at this. Most people would think <laughs> that was pretty good. But... Um, okay. So my wife was a gymnast mm -hmm. and we met at Michigan and she's a great gymnast. She actually was able to parlay her gymnastic skills into a job. And she worked for Cirque du Soleil for five years cool. as a trapeze artist. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. So she knows what it's like to be a professional athlete, use her body for her, her craft. And so we weren't making any money through the Olympics. I like no money. Um, it was, yeah. Like it, you'd be surprised. Like you're, you think you're at the, the peak of your, your sport and it's not a viable entity. Right. Um, but I was like, you know, we, there are, I might be able to make money, maybe not a lot, but I could do it, but maybe I could get even better and maybe we could make it happen. So mm -hmm. she opened her own business and then I was like, I'm going into triathlon and seems like it worked out. Yeah, it worked okay. out. Worked out. <laughs> we'll take it. But then, I mean, you were kind of mentioning ITU after you like didn't make the 2018, which I know is very, yeah. it was a lot more kind of like discretionary back then. Um, mm -hmm. Bummer. Yeah, because you were the 2007, 2008, like, triathlete of the year, but you didn't make the team. Right. I know. <laughs> yeah. So then you kind of moved into long course, right? Like, that's sort of because you were done with all that. Yeah. Um, so it was like kind of like as the door was closing with what was apparent at the time with draft legal, you know, I, I, I kept my toe in it, but mm -hmm. um like I raced in 09 a little bit. Um, I think I did a race in 12. Uh, but I, I, I did my first Ironman in 08. Mm -hmm. And it was great. It was great. It was, and by great, I mean awful and awesome wrapped into one. I feel like I remember a quote from you at the time that this is always whenever ever people ask about Ironman training. I was like, well, Andy Potts once was asked, how's it going? And he said, well, I've shit myself twice. And once it was worth it because I was winning. Oh, okay. So there is a rule. <laughs> yeah. So um, it's happened more than twice, but you're allowed to do it for the W. Right. 
you're not allowed to do it if the W is just not a, just even like a remote possibility. If if you've got like a sliver of hope for a W, maybe you can roll the dice. But if you're just like out of the mix, uh uh-uh, uh, you should go to that porta john. <laughs> So that's your rule. Or, that's, that's the rule, or guys. The, or the bushes. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's a oh, good yeah. rule, actually. It, it, you know, like if this is your job, you got to make some sacrifices. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's not pretty. Yeah. So, you, you've, so you've enjoyed moving up. I mean, moving up is always a weird way to say it, but you've enjoyed the longer distances, the Ironmans. The... Yeah. So and the haves and the Ironmans. Um, even events like Alcatraz, like I had mentioned before. Mm -hmm. So there's a certain vibe to them, right? It's a little bit less, uh, for me, it's always been a little less stressful. Mm -hmm. Um, And there's that built-in community. Sometimes it felt awkward when you do some ITU races. Like I would race in an island in Japan. It's a beautiful place, just awesome. But there were a hundred people there and the people who weren't racing were racing in two hours. It was the women. Right. 50 women, 50 men. And that's who showed up. And so there wasn't in like a little bit of the community would show up. So that was tough. And it's gotten a ton better. Um, but sometimes you have to go to remote places with draft, non-drafting. Like you're usually, I mean, a lot of the races I go to like 2000 people mm-hmm. and then their family and uh, friends, or even if they're solo, they're, they're there in the morning, right? Setting right. up their bike and, uh, we're in the same transition and we're just sharing the course and sharing the experiences. And so there's, there's a camaraderie with that and there's a vibe to it. Um, and it's just, um, it, it's kind of lifted my heart a little bit. You know, I, I'll stick around after sometimes with racing and cheering people on because mm-hmm. like they're, they're getting after it just like I am. Um, I mean, maybe even sometimes more so they're holding down jobs right. and doing this thing. Right. Um, so I got, I got a ton of respect for the athletes that put it out there and choose to voluntarily sign up and do it for, for the love, you know? Yeah. I feel like we always, you, everyone has like an Andy Potts. It's hanging out at the buffet at the hotel, Andy Potts yeah. at the grocery store across the street. Like it's just always like, yeah. I'm just a dude. <laughs> I got kids. Yeah. I got a wife who, you know, if she, you know, I, I whom I try to make happy and try to share things with my family first and friends second and others third, right? right. So like right. there's a priority to it, but um, yes, yeah, share more, share cool stuff, right? Um, I know uh, you've talked some. I've like heard you talk some about like it is changing again though it is like sponsorship contracts are getting harder it is getting harder to make like a living you might you know there's a reason that uh we are seeing some people kind of retire are you starting to think about that is it getting tricky is it or are you just gonna do this forever uh, okay great great point um we had a really nice uh it's, I wouldn't call it our heyday, but we had a really nice uptick mm-hmm. in non-endemic involvement in the sport of triathlon from more or less like 08 right. through 12, 13. When like Toyota sponsored a series and right, yeah. all that. Yeah. yeah. I was with Toyota when they yeah. were on the series, right? So they were a great sponsor. Um, they, they were into it. Um, they saw the value in it and the sport was growing with double digit growth. And so I I was, I'm very fortunate to have been at the top of my game when there was support outside of the brands that are currently in the sport in involved. And so uh, for that, I'll be forever thankful. And, um, it's harder now. I feel like it's always in anything you do, right? Whether you are in the business world, if you are, uh, if you if you find excellence, right? Mm-hmm. The, the the few excellence is is in short supply in no matter what you do. Right. You don't have to be a triathlete to find that excellence in your uh, profession is hard, and it gets rewarded. But to the victor go the spoils type of thing, and, and that's a true maxim because 
the rich tend to get richer when you're performing and you're doing well um, across sports, across business, across life. And it, it, right now, it's 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 pretty difficult to um, to really make a living. You know, I've got a family to support. Um, you know, for me, I'm I'm 43. I'm going to be 44. Um, it's harder sledding, but I'm trying to show value in other ways and other right. means and more or less by being me. Um, but I started a team, like I said before, um, you started that a couple of years ago. That was, you were kind of like one of the first people to have a team and like reach out to age groupers and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's like fourth or fifth year now. Mm -hmm. I'll say it's like fifth year, but, um, it's harder. It's certainly harder. And I, um, I'm not leaving. Uh, that's good. But yeah, but <laughs> at the same time, like you gotta feel you you feel for people who who boy they're just scratching that itch right now, and they're like me, when you know twenty years ago, it's like I maybe I could be good, and they've already been really really good. And if you just give them a little more rope, if you give them a little more support, you could see true excellence, and they just needed time. I hope that the tomorrow, the future of tomorrow, doesn't give up on it because it's not a lucrative endeavor. Right. Um, it can, it can boomerang and can, can come back around. It's not a bad way to make a living. I mean, I swim, bike and run. Come on. <laughs> Doesn't seem bad to me. No, <laughs> no. I mean, it is painful, but come on, seriously. Like I, I get paid to train and I race for free more or less. Oh, okay. Yeah. Cause the trainings, I mean, like you're making sacrifices. You're, you're, like, and it's always the people that are closest to you when you get really tired and grumpy, they always pay, get the brunt of it mm -hmm. and they don't deserve it. <laughs> they really don't. They love you. They want the best for you. They want to see you kick butt and you're being mean to them or short with them because you're tired because right. you rode for five hours and ran for an hour and swam, you know, like... They don't deserve that. But uh, yeah, that's been something that's kind of been evened out as uh, I've gotten a little older. I've been able to um, even out my temperament a little bit on the day to day, okay. which has helped. Um, yeah, avoid, it, it avoids the fights. That's key. Which, See, Andy's just full of advice for everybody today. <laughs> which, which I'm always wrong in the fight. Like, I'm not saying like, uh, who's right, who's wrong. No, no, no. Like straight up, I'm wrong because I was lazy with something around the house. Like I didn't fold the laundry or do the dishes or something. That's, that's on me. Um, but yeah. What other, so I feel like what other things you feel like you've learned over your 19 years of triathlon that you like, oh, I would, you know, I did that wrong 10, 15 years, but now I've learned. All right. All right. Okay. So, so number one is fueling. Mm -hmm. Right. If you are properly fueled and you keep like a mini stash that something that whether it's uh, it, could, it could be anything for you. If you're properly fueling throughout the day, you, you it's less fewer peaks and fewer valleys. You definitely even out the blood sugar. Mm -hmm. um, you're you're fueling properly while you're doing it, but after and before you're doing whatever you're doing. Um, and then you have your go to's like uh I, I like pretzels. Um, my tummy handles sourdough pretzels really well. Sourdough bread is in the di digestive system. It's easier to digest than other types of bread, and it's quicker. Uh, so I like sourdough pretzels, stuff like that. Like I go to the, I go to nuts pretty quickly as like kind of my go-to away from like what I'm drinking while I'm doing it, which is I, I do I'm on infinite. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I, I think. Yeah, if you're fueling properly during and pre and post, it helps a lot. That's probably my one of my biggest tips. And the other one is sleep. Okay. Um, prioritizing sleep. You don't have to be a great sleeper, right? Great sleepers are going to find excellence in their pursuits because their parents gave them good stuff to sleep, right? As long <laughs> as you're hitting, right? No, seriously, like, the great athletes are, are usually great sleepers. Yeah, no, I've heard there's like a correlation between like really good nappers mm -hmm. or really good athletes. Yeah, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. true. So 
Um, I mean, you got to do the, the little things right along the way, though. Okay. Uh, cool room, dark room, no blue light, uh, elevate your feet, um, <laughs> stuff like that. Okay. Uh, find the right pillow. And if you're nervous about your pillow, travel with the pillow that you like. Wow. Okay. Because that way you don't get any like sore necks and, you, and your head knows it and stuff. Yeah. Okay. That Those two things. Fuel right. Sleep right. I heard you once on a panel also say that if you were left to your own devices, you would bike like 30 hours a week, like bike alone, add in swimming and run. Basically, you would overtrain if you were left to your own devices, that you would just go crazy. I would. <laughs> Does that sound typical for triathletes? <laughs> a little bit. Yeah, I would. Um, that's the number one thing I count on my coach. His name is Mike. He's been my coach. Uh, he went with me over to Athens. Oh, wow. Um, he's been with me forever. And, uh, that's what I count on him for. He's like, whoa, horses. Like, you are going down this path. Don't do it. Come on back. Come on <laughs> back. We're going short and fast today. Okay. Like, all right. All right. Yeah. So what do you think, obviously, like right now, it's really hard to make plans for the year. Like nobody. But what are you kind of seeing uh, as your plans for the future, you know, this year, next year? What do you still want to do in the sport? Yeah. Great yeah. question. Um things I want to do in the sport. Okay. So it's always been about doing cool stuff. Okay. Um, with cool people. That's kind of like the, the table stakes, like cool stuff with cool people. I got the cool people part checked because <laughs> I made, I made two of them. Um, so I get to, you know, I'll bring my, my kids to races. Uh, not all of them anymore. Cause they, they're not on my lap. So they'll fly for free. <laughs> um, and the, the cool places, like there are a few races that I'd love to do. Um, you know what is a really nice scene right now is South America. Um, it's got a good, good, uh, good vibe to it. Um, um, I'd love to have a couple of North American Ironmans come back into uh, races I'm allowed to do, um, like you- Coeur d'Alene. There's rumor that it's coming back. You mean allowed, like on the pro calendar a, and yeah, as a professional. okay, right, right, right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, like I can't do like I think I can't do like Placid this year or something. Right. It's not a men's pro race, and yeah, yeah. like Wisconsin, I love. Yeah, but, like that. Yeah, I want to do Wisconsin. Yeah, I want to do Wisconsin. I want to do. Um, I'd love to go back to Coeur d'Alene. I'd love to go back to Lake Placid, but like camp this year um things races like that um i can see definitely in my future and then i don't know if you have really drilled down into the mentality of some of the races in europe but sometimes in america we get there's a little bit of a crossover with uh, attrition rate and so if uh, an iron man has a high attrition rate there's a tendency to be like yeah no bad and they cancel right. and the race. It's- and that's not, that shouldn't necessarily be the mentality, right? right. Uh, and that's what it's been in a few of the races in Europe that I've done. Um, they don't necessarily mind a high attrition rate if they're delivering the product, if they're evolving the event. Huh. And I think that we need to look at how can we make the event better? How can we make the experience better? Not just from gun gun to the tape but from the time that you show up into the town or city to the time you leave like what can we do to make the experience more impactful um and then specifically for the course like don't be scared if it's a high attrition rate right um you mean like hard courses like you're saying like the hard courses in the u.s that a lot of people don't finish they tend to kind of go away and disappear they do yeah they do and it um, I understand why I understand people want to check a box, but like, boy, it, what if it is the hardest Ironman out there and you did it like, that'd be awesome. Yeah. Right. Um, so I think we can, we can evolve here to make a better race, um, experience. And sometimes that might be harder. Sometimes it's not always harder. Um, and sometimes you get stuck with bad luck, like, or, or just bad conditions, not like necessarily a race. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, Tahoe got snowed out one year. Mm-hmm. And then uh, Coeur d'Alene, I, I did it one year. I'm not making this number up. It was 108 degrees when I finished. And then was it like two years later, people were like hypothermic because it was so cold? Yeah. Yes, <laughs> yes. Like, so that, that's just rolling the dice. Like, I remember one year, like, there was lightning in, in um, 
Lake Placid, like right. straight up lightning storm during the race. I was oh, like, yeah. I'm not stopping. You're shooting to stop. I did it two years ago and it was like a massive storm. I was terrified. It was terrifying. <laughs> Terrifyingly awesome. <laughs> as long as it's safe, right? right? Like you don't want to put people in peril, right? Okay. Yeah. okay. And, and that's a dangerous thing too. Like you got to look at what these race directors are putting together and, and they want to have a successful event. So it's a little scary and risky if you evolve a re- event into something that's really, really difficult. Right. That people so can't I, do. Yeah. I see both sides of the coin. So, but right. I think also you look at some of the rent events that are gaining traction. Um, they, they are extreme. And like you look at some of the Norse man and, right. and Alaska man right. and things like that. Yeah. Right. They're definitely picking up. There's been a story I've been wanting to do the rise of the extreme triathlons, right? It's yeah. a thing. It's happening. Yeah, it is. Yeah. So you might yep. do some of that. So we might see you doing one of these like self-supported across Patagonia type of races. That'd be awesome. <laughs> I got I got people I know who could support me. Okay. I got two of them. I got two of them. <laughs> I, ma- I made them. They have to. They don't have a choice. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> cool. Um, well, usually we like end with a, a fun like, would you rather? And I was trying to think like, what would we do? If- I know. But then like now I like I feel like it's all this pressure because Andy Potts, right? No, no pressure. No, no pressure. pressure. I'm just the guy. <laughs> And we play this game all the time. Actually, I think we played it yesterday in the car. Really? Okay, well, now I want to know what you guys said yesterday in the car. What was yours? So yesterday we were driving to the incline and my daughter is giving us like top 10 deadliest insects, top 10 deadliest, oh, okay. most most dangerous sports. And then she's like, okay, we're done with the top 10s list. Let's play Would You Rather. I'm like, okay, let's do it. I'm in. I'm all about games. Um so we played, I don't remember the questions. Okay. What would you rather? So they're, they're usually like, um, they're usually hard choices to make. Hmm. So yeah. Okay. I wish I, had, I wish I had one on the tip of my tongue. Right. I'm right. Now I'm like, now I'm like curious. Yeah. I'll All text right. them to you. How's that? I'll <laughs> okay. put them in show notes. <laughs> there you go. Yes. You, you will tell us and we will add them to the show notes. It'll be great. Boom. Um, all right. So here's my question for you. Would you rather, since we were talking about pooping yourself during Iron, poop yourself, <laughs> but win the Iron Man. Or not, come but come in second. No, I've done that. And right. You, I'd go, rather you win. pick. You pick win. Okay. So you're just like, yeah, no that, question. Oh, come on. For sure. <laughs> w. W. Every time. Yeah. That's why I race. I race to win. Okay. Right? So it's easy. I up. Yeah. I mean, like, well, winning's not easy, but no. um, easy choice here for sure. Okay. okay. Yeah. yeah. Just go. Just go clean up after. It's not like it hasn't happened before. It's going to happen again, probably, too. It's going to happen again. All right. There you go, guys. See, Andy Potts is all lots of advice for everybody. So, oh, For the W only. There's an asterisk. <laughs> well, thank you so much for coming and talking to us. Uh, I feel like, you know, everybody probably learned something. So, Thank you very much, Kelly. I'm, I'm uh, honored to be on, and I appreciate you asking me to, to join you. Thanks to Andy and Shauna for chatting with us. We'll have more info and a few of Andy's daughter's would you rathers in our show notes. Don't forget to subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts. We'll be back next Wednesday with another episode. And until then, keep training.